Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club in virtual view. We look forward to meeting everybody back in the grill room just as soon as this pandemic has passed. In the meantime, we're going to use this online format to bring you interesting speakers on a broad range of subjects. Our speaker today was born in Manhattan and grew up in the Bronx and Queens. Graduated with an electrical engineering degree in 1966 from the City College of New York. He moved to the West Coast later in his career and after a stint with National Cash Register's mainframe division, uh, he moved to the Marina District in San Francisco. He's a very, very interesting and thoughtful engineer, as you're going to see. He's the key speaker, but just to make the point about the Marina District and the dangers therein, We've brought a resident of the Marina District who also happens to be a resident in the harbor at the San Francisco Small Boat Harbor in the Marina District. Uh, our speaker, who is a resident of the Marina District and a sailor, Bruce Stone is a great sailor, uh, born in Providence, Rhode Island, started sailing as a 10 year old on little small dinghies on the East Coast, moved to the West Coast in 1980 and became an earnest and really terrific sailor. By 1999, he bought a J-105, a fleet that he would come to know very, very well. He'll win in, he would win in North America two times and go on to be the St. Francis Sailor of the Year twice at the St. Francis Yacht Club. His wife is also an incredibly accomplished sailor, having been the Sailor of the Yachtsman of the Year once and three-time Yachtswoman of the Year for the St. Francis Yacht Club and a great, great sailor in her own right. The two of them have quite a tale to tell. So Dan Clark and Bruce Stone, Dan Clark, the engineer and resident of Marina District and Bruce Stone, the sailor and resident of Marina District, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. We are enthusiastic to hear your story and uh, how it has an effect on other people who are in the San Francisco Bay Area, live in the Marina District and other people in cities around the world whose harbors may be similarly uh, polluted by old mineral deposits, etc. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me. And thank you, Bruce, for being here to support me in this uh, uh, story. I, I'm, I'm honored to be, to be invited to, to talk before this group. I'd like to start uh, by um, just uh, uh, giving you a little overview about the uh, the topic that uh, affects the both the onshore and offshore areas of uh, uh, northern northern San Francisco. It's manufactured gas plants and the contamination that came from them. Uh, manufactured gas plants produced gas similar to the gas that we use today for heating and for cooking, but that gas we use today is natural gas. Gas, similar to that, for similar purposes, was made from coal and it was used for cooking and heating, but also for lighting. This gas was made at plants and it resulted in some uh, chemicals getting into the environment. It's an interesting industry that started around 1800 in England and spread rapidly to the industrialized countries. It was in the United States in uh, Baltimore in 1816. San Francisco's history with manufactured gas was only a shorter period, uh, about 80 years from the 1850s to the 1930s. You don't see manufactured gas plants uh, uh, anywhere today because all of the structures have been taken down um, and although the structures have been taken down mostly, there's still uh, some foundations and other uh, artifacts of the, uh, the buildings underground, but there's an awful lot of the contamination that was produced as a part of the gas manufacturing uh, process. The, these byproducts are designated as hazardous chemicals designated by the Environmental Protection Agency and they're the kind of chemicals that, that last in the environment for an incredibly long period of time. So I want to show you where, we're, where we are and uh, where some of these first uh, signs of this, uh, this hazardous waste uh, came about. 
At this point, we've gotten into the northern shore of uh, uh, San Francisco, and you no may have noticed on your uh, on your screen that some harbors have been uh, named here. There's a yacht harbor on the left, and center is a uh, harbor called Gas House Cove, and that's the 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 place that I want to um, look at first. We'll see shortly a an area where uh, some boats are moored and there's a boom around a part of this harbor and that's a, con a containment boom. It's a skirted boom that, that holds back any material that might come to the surface. There was a another pier here and there was a video taken of something bubbling up in this area and I'm just going to show you a little bit of that video so that you get an idea of what, what was seen and then I'll come back to this view and tell you more about it now. Yeah, another couple more just popped up right there. Ooh, those are big ones. video was taken in 2012. It wasn't until I believe 2015 that it was ascertained that it was uh, something to do with manufactured gas plants. You'll see that where the, uh, where the corner of that pink object came up, that's the footprint of the manufactured gas plant. And the thing bubbling to the surface was just in the upper right hand corner of that gas plant. So an, an MGP is, uh, uh, is the cause of the contamination in, in this area and the reason that uh, gas, uh, gas House Cove hasn't been dredged for a very long time. What I want to do is look at the marina district and where these plants were uh, located in, in time. Before the plants were built, the San Francisco area looked like this chart. There, uh, the bottom of this chart shows what is now known as Cow Hollow. The marina is mostly the area that's uh, in the water and the gas plants would be built after this time frame, where the red arrows are, are positioned here. I can, I can show those same objects. This blue line that has appeared on your screen now is the same shoreline as was on that chart that I, I just showed you. The idea of the plants being built on the waterfront when they were built and operated and now being inland is uh, a part of this story. Using this old time map, I, can, uh, I will illustrate to you that the bay fill that happened as San Francisco transitioned from uh, the gold rush era to today's uh, shoreline, the shoreline grew out. The L-shaped MGP is one MGP and this other odd shape and MGP, it's a rectangle and then a square. Those are part of the same MGP. You can, you can see that the, uh, the L-shaped one is between Laguna and not quite Webster. So Dan, when I first read this report, I was quite concerned as a resident because these uh, plants were right near where I live and where our friends have kids in school playing in the schoolyard. And I'm worried about the contamination of the soil in the backyard worried about the resale opportunity for the, maybe this prejudice is the title of the, of the properties and they can't be resold. They are all uh, uh, important questions and areas to be, to be uh, investigated here with this, uh, the problems that are left over from the uh, manufactured gas plants. Well, is it dangerous to garden in your backyard if your home is near one of these affected spots? I lived in this neighborhood, uh, actually right in, uh, in this area on, on this MGP. I, I, uh, my, myself and my wife uh, have a home here for 18 years and I had uh, MGP contamination in my backyard on the surface. I can show you that if, if you want to go there now. 
my home is literally this this home that's sort of dead center here the, the blue home that's my home on on north point street uh, for locals it's sort of kitty corner from the from the safeway uh, that's my home and all these other homes that have just shown up in blue with the uh, with the red background are other homes which have been purchased by the local utility company uh, because of the contamination in, in this area. Looking at where Dan's house was and the other houses, what kind of thoughts do you have on this center? Well, we have friends in those houses. My brother's medical office is right near there. I'm, I'm wondering, did PG&E reach out to people and say, we're gonna condemn your house and give you fair market value? Or did people have to hire an attorney and uh, impress their case? And you know, what was the catalyst for those homes being bought out? Yes, thank you. The PG&E uh, started a program in 2010 where they reached out to residents in the general area and asked if they could come and do testing in their, on their properties, usually in their backyards. That led to the current situation, which is uh, roughly 10 families have sold their homes to the pg and and another 20 or so have had their homes uh, re uh, remediated is the term and have had uh, uh, a sort of a deed restric restriction placed on them. So is pg and the good guy here because they reached out to take care of this problem or was somebody uh, lighting a fire under them? No, uh, that's an that's interesting question. My, uh, my under I, I know that PG&E, no one lit a fire under them. They reached out. We just covered the residences. Now let's go jump back to the harbor. What are the implications for the harbor, the depths of the harbor, the operations of the harbor? What, what's going on there? These black stars that have shown up on your screen now are warning signs that have occurred. Tell me what the black stars represent, Dan. Are these um, deposits? Are these stuff erupting out of the water? And how do they get to be on this map? Who put them on the map? From research that I've done the, uh, into the findings that have occurred since uh, about 40 years ago, uh, there have been a number of these warning signs that have come, come, come about. Uh, and so I have placed these black stars where there have been in some kind of an indication of MGP contamination. There have been many of them over, over time. So these are reported contamination sites? These are sites where contamination of some kind have been indicated, yes. But they've been drilling boreholes to kind of set parameters. We know they send us notices as in the marina and we see them out there drilling and taking samples. Is that the same as this or is this is just, you saw a coal tar bubbling up and that was a warning sign. Those X's there indicate areas since 2010 that PG&E has been uh, probing. And you, you'll notice that there's areas that are spread out where the X's are far apart and uh, there's areas where they're concentrated. The areas where, they, where they're where they very concentrated are literally in the backyards of people's homes. So the, the distribution of the sample points is not even, it's <coughs> biased toward the homeowners. So that's, I think, what you're referring to. And the notices that you've received are, uh, or that's just that this is happening in the neighborhood. And my understanding is the implications in the harbor is that they were supposed to dredge to 12 feet in West Harbor when they renovated it 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And in some places in inner, inner West Harbor where my boat was, they only dredged to eight feet. So on Dan's chart here, uh, that arrow on the bottom, the red arrow is close to where my boat was along Marina Boulevard, very convenient walk from my house. I was a little further to the West along Div at the Divisadero. Nevertheless, um, they were supposed to dredge to 12 feet, uh, knowing that the harbor would silt in a little bit over time. They only dredged to eight feet because they saw so much toxicity underneath there that they would then have to bring in many feet of clean sand on top of it. So they'd have to dredge three extra feet, four extra feet, and add in clean sand and never get to the target depth. So they 
financially speaking, they stopped at eight, which means this harbor is rapidly becoming unusable along Marina Boulevard, which accounts for a large number of slips because they're getting shallower and shallower every single year. And that relates to this liability that PG&E has. I understand PG&E has accepted responsibility for this toxic situation. They're supposed to pay for new dredging, especially in East Harbor, but the bankrupt, they dragged their feet for years, then they went bankrupt. But I also understand they've set aside money in a reserve fund to cover the East Harbor job. Is that correct, Dan? In terms of money, there is a separate funding stream that is uh, for environmental projects that PG&E has uh, to, uh, available to them. It's agreed to by the Public Utilities Commission. When PG&E filed for bankruptcy a year or so ago, uh, their environmental programs were not affected. They just as they gave you gas and electric continuously, they went out, went ahead with their environmental programs. So money comes from a separate stream. It's a surcharge on top of everybody's gas bill. Uh, the 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 thing that impacted your your slip here in the, uh, in this part of the harbor was something that occurred before the program that I mentioned earlier, uh, the current program. Then uh, this was uh, the harbor renovation when they were gearing up to do it. Not PG&E, but when the city was gearing up to do it, they discovered these hot spots in the harbor. So the area in blue was designated as okay uh, to dredge that area because you could take that material and place it someplace else. The area, the white areas that are in, in red uh, are, uh, were hot spots, not, not suitable. You couldn't take that material and just place it any place else. And that's a cost issue. So that's, that's what happened. And you described adequately or, or excellently what, what happened is they changed the plan. The original plan was to dredge deeper they decided not to dredge deeper because they didn't want to deal with this material. So where do we go from here? Is the harbor ever gonna get done? Um, my, my belief, uh, my understanding actually about West Harbor is there is no plan whatsoever to touch it in anything that's going on with PG&E at this time. That's my understanding. Um, I would like to bring in uh, another factor on this subject, which is there was a consent decree signed uh, recently between uh, the San Francisco Herring Association and PG&E. And it, it dealt with a great deal of this waterfront, but it specifically uh, carved out West Harbor for a special treatment in that nothing with that consent decree could cause, uh, would could force PG&E to do anything about West Harbor. It's, it was done 10 years ago. There's uh, a strong impetus not to touch it. That's different than East Harbor. This is, this is East Harbor. This is uh, the area where the video was taken. The arrow points to the same location where, where that video was taken, where the bubbling is, is seen and still seen today. Let me ask you, what is that stuff bubbling out? Is this coal tar that's in liquid form? In layman's words, it's coal tar. In, uh, uh, it's, but coal tar is tar. Tar has different constituencies. Most coal tar that we're used to is heavier than water. So uh, it's uh, dense, it's considered dense, uh, particular type of con contamination, and it settles down. But a large deposit of, of uh, coal tar uh, would also have some of the lighter components in it. So there's a large deposit in this area and uh, it is the lighter deposit, the lighter parts of that coal tar are finding their way to a seep and coming up out of the seep just as you see a seep uh, any, you know, then but to, to explain why this is an issue for boaters is that this entire harbor was scheduled to be ripped out 10 years ago because the docks are decrepit the way East West Harbor was. West Harbor went ahead only because the state allowed us to segregate the two projects, given this one was so heavily contaminated. We went ahead and redid West Harbor pending further studies here and 
PG&E contributing to the rip out and the dredging. So we're at the point, I believe, where PG&E has accepted responsibility for dredging this harbor and we have to set parameters to it now as to what they're going to do. Are they going to dredge it out? They're going to put cement down there, cap it with sand. What are they going to do with the toxins in this harbor? Yes, uh, I would. I absolutely uh, agree with you. Uh, although I would go back further in time, the the West uh, East Harbor was known to be contaminated with uh, uh, the the byproducts of the MGP plants. 1994 was when they first discovered it, and it's 26 years later, and there have been numerous investigations in in Gashouse Cove. Uh, you may know that the city of San Francisco sued or brought PG&E to court in 2000. And the, the, uh, the claim was that uh, uh, PG&E would have to pay for the dredging of Gashouse Cove. Uh, uh, so it was a, a, a suit over costs, not a suit over the environmental impact of these, these MGP, uh, MGP contaminants. Uh, the, the judge dismissed that uh, suit with, without prejudice. Uh, because it was premature, because the city of San Francisco did not actually dredge the harbor, incur costs, and then say PG&E has to pay for it. The judge said, well, it's premature, so, that, so he dismissed the case. It essentially was a win for PG&E. At the end of that, and still in 2000, PG&E and, and uh, the city got into, uh, made a cost-sharing agreement, which, which, which cost-sharing was for at least four more investigations, of which there have been many. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm not certain if the cost-sharing agreement is for what the dredging or remediation will be. So that bubbling that we saw uh, there and, and what all of the most recent investigations have uh, discovered is a smallish patch of coal tar. They, the, the best that, uh, description of it is it, it's 50 foot by 50 foot. It's up to several feet thick. It's uh, maybe six feet below the bottom of the, uh, the bay or the, yeah, the, the bottom, the, the sediment level, about six feet down. And it extends both in the bay and, and onto the onshore, the deposit is. It's a particularly concentrated form of coal tar and all of the focus is on that. In my opinion, there will be more studies and it will be a number of years before any fix is decided. They will first, in my opinion, they will first decide what to do about that seep that's coming up because that's uh, incredibly uh, egregious environmental impact. Uh, they shouldn't be seeping coal tar into San Francisco Bay. It just should not be. They have to decide that and how to fix that. It's not easy to fix, but they will have to decide that and they will probably dredge the the gas house cove either at the same time or soon thereafter. It will still be a number of years until that happens. And while that happens, no one is looking at the much broader picture of the four MGPs that are in the area and how all of these things uh, are affecting people. Is there an action item here if a concerned resident or concerned boater wants to help this process along, what do you recommend they do? Nothing is really gonna change very much unless people take action. I, I, I think you know, I have take, personally taken action. I have, uh, I am, have in the past and I'm still in a lawsuit with the uh, PG&E. Uh, I could tell you about that. But uh, that, that kind of action, you, you can take a legal action. Boat owners, as, as well as homeowners who know this, uh, uh, have have rights for access to these areas, rights to use and enjoy this, this area. Dan, fascinating how much research you've done on this subject. In your best estimate, how much do you think PG&E has spent to date fixing the problem of hazardous waste in the marine district and harbors? It's between 100 and 200 million. And what do you think they're going to have to spend to get it fixed from here? Oh, uh, I would I would venture another couple of hundred million. Okay, how would they repair such damage in this historic environment? They're going to have to uh, 
do some uh, remediations that involve deactivating the coal tar. Uh, they're going to have to either inject uh, uh, bioagents down into it or inject uh, surfacants, uh, soap-like materials down into it or heat and, and cause it to, uh, to dissipate. That remediation isn't to remove it, that's to inject it with something. But is this like Chernobyl where they should just pour some concrete over the top of it and walk away? I mean, or something on top of it down below in the harbor, for instance? Or why not remove it? There's two, two postulates before you, Dan. I know it's hard for a crisp answer, but <laughs> Bruce is saying, what, ha what happens if you pour cement over it and seal it? And I'm saying, what about removing it? Where, why are those two not likely to be their course of action? The... Uh access to where the contamination is is extremely difficult uh, access on uh, with in the harbor is actually much easier than access under the homes in the marina it's very difficult to do uh, there are uh, things like solidifying the contamination they literally inject a, a coagulant down into it and stir it up in the hopes that what is tar in sand becomes a block of cement. And so the, it sort of immobilizes it. It's not my favorite answer, but it's, it's one of the ones they're looking at for at. So Dan, how many hours have you spent researching this subject? It's been 10 years in it, and I would estimate it's uh, thousands of hours. I've never tried to track it. It is. Uh, it's a very big subject with a lot of twists and turns. So Bruce, how long ago did you discover the toxic waste in this whole can of worms? Well, it came up when we were advocating for both West Harbor and East Harbor to be renovated at the same time. And they came, the this Department of Public Works that was working on this for Rec and Park came back to us and said, well, we're not going to dredge uh, West Harbor as deep as you guys want because our borings have shown all this stuff under there. And then they said East Harbor, we can't touch at all uh, because it's even worse. And, and we believe PG&E is responsible. So we're going to go after them to put up the $10 million they thought it was going to be at the time to, uh, to dredge East Harbor. And now I hear it's $100 million to dredge each harbor or more or, or to cap it. Uh, and so East Harbor, which is losing functionality, birth holders have had to move out because their, their peers, their docks have drifted away. And the city is not allowed to put a new piling back in to stabilize the docks because they'd stir up these uh, chemicals that are there. So little by little, East Harbor is becoming completely unusable to, to birth holders. And as the head of the Harbor Association, that's of great concern to me, I get a constituency of 660 birth holders um, who want to be able to use the harbor. And now we're down to maybe only, we lost like maybe a hundred births in there, maybe more. And um, it's an untenable situation and getting worse. So we're anxious for a pg to come out of bankruptcy, get back on stream to working with Rec and Park to uh, put a plan in place to dredge or cap the situation in East Harbor, I'm not talking about the residential side of it now, just the harbor side, and um, take care of that by itself, address the residences in other ways, buying people out, burying it, making tearing the houses down. I don't know what they're doing with those houses. Dan, was your house torn down or was it sold to somebody with a red flag on it that they can't resell it? No, it wasn't torn down. It's still owned by PG&E. Um, PG&E, as I said, bought about 10 of them. They have resold some of them. They're, they have uh, never torn down, but they've done very extensive uh, uh, remediations and some remodeling, uh, which means digging out the backyard, digging out underneath the slab in the garage. And the red flag that you mentioned, uh, that they, they will sell them, people will buy these homes, but the red flag is, really a, a something that's called a land use covenant or a deed restrict, restriction on these properties. Dan, how many homes are affected by um, this hazardous waste? Yeah, so far they have uh, engaged with, I uh, believe about, but my number is 36. So someplace in their number may be slightly different. 
so, so now have 36 houses that they've engaged with, does that mean how many of them have bad soil? Is that the yes, same? Um, all, all, all but five have bad soil. And if we just set an average price of two million a house, you're saying that's like $70 million or so if they were to, if that average was accurate. So what would be, is that, that's not likely what they're gonna do. They're not gonna spend 70 million bucks, buy the houses and in a bulk fashion, uh, clean up the soil under the houses? They're in the process of working through these individual homes uh, a little at a time. And when I say that, every homeowner is different uh, and ready at a certain point in time or not ready at a certain point in time. So PG&E does make overtures to them and, and tries to, to test the area and then work out whatever happens after it. It's a process that's been going on for 10 years and I predict it will continue to go on. There are many homes that have not been addressed yet so, so Bruce, you were president for 10 years of the Boat Owners Association in the two harbors. Did I hear you say there were 660 boats uh, yes. in your group? So there were 660 in the harbor. We had about half of them were actually members of the, of the Marina Harbor Association. Okay. And so what are they doing? Are, are they all keeping their berths as they are now? Or are they being forced out of them as the environment gets ugly? What's happened? Yes, those who are in East Harbor, uh, when the berth drifts away or falls apart, uh, they've been sometimes offered a spot in West Harbor, but many of them have smaller boats that are too small for the larger slips in West Harbor, so they've actually gone elsewhere in the bay. So we're basically losing harbor space in this district. So yes, saying? plus there's a known problem with the breakwater being insufficient and a lot of surge issues in there where boats get whipped back and forth and the lines break and damage to the boat. So part of the renovation project is to do a new breakwater. How many and that hours? gets back to the PG&E issue because you can't build the breakwater unless you solve the toxic problem. How many hours have you as a volunteer spent, do you think, uh, working on this whole harbor issue? An enormous amount, similar to what Dan has done. Give me a number. <laughs> <laughs> Thousands, thousands of hours, including uh, represent going to City Hall and working in front of BCDC, helping helping the city get the permits, uh, helping them get the Cal Boating Waterways uh, loan for the harbor. We testified that it was a good thing to do. We went through designs and uh, hearings, everything. So Dan, what would concerned homeowners who are watching this program, not just those in San Francisco's Marina District, but those in any region anywhere, what would you want them to do? to support the Marina District homeowners. Do you have a website? Talk a little bit about that. To get more information, I definitely have a website. It's mgpdata.com, and the map that I was using is accessed uh, through that. mgpdata.com is the website. On the website, very prominent is a button that says View MGP Map. If you touch, click that button, a separate window will open so Bruce, uh, what would you want boat owners who are concerned about this loss of berths and um, you know uh, other in inconveniences in the harbor? What would you like them to do? I mean, we're watching uh, this September date where PG&E is supposed to emerge from bankruptcy. I spoke to the harbor master today, and he said that that's a milestone they're looking forward to uh, reinvigorating. Uh, the plan for East Harbor. He said the people's opinions will be accepted and you know, applied and negotiated and so forth. And um, so people should be attuned this fall to uh, seeing what they come up with and, and start participating in the process so that the kind of harbor we get is what represents the needs of the people. And it's small boats, large boats, so forth, different, different uses, paddlers, kayakers. The Bay Area Water Trail has the rights to have a landing in there. Uh, so easy access to people for kayakers and so forth as well. So we expect to do all these kinds of things. So Dan Clark, San Francisco citizen and a citizen engineer who's developed this incredible website with the data points and fascinating maps that show the history of the San Francisco Marina District and Harbor. And Bruce Stone, boat owner uh, in the harbor and homeowner in the neighborhood, thank both of you for your very, very thoughtful volunteer efforts in service to the broader community. And we very much appreciate you speaking on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, our luncheon is adjourned.